Thank you very much. And most welcome to this final session for on this very exciting um, conference. My name is Sofia Svarvar and I'm a facilitator. I will facilitate this uh, session, but I am a coordinator at the policy unit at International Department, Church of Sweden. The purpose of this session is to explore Nordic lessons from universal welfare system and how and if they are relevant in a development context. And with us, we have uh, Gunilla Palm, Policy Advisor on Sustainable Livelihood and Social Security from Church of Sweden. And Oli Kangas, Professor and Research Director at Kela, Social, in Social Insurance Institution of Finland. And on Skype, Isabel, I think you can hear me, but we can't see yeah. at the moment, but Isabel Fry, uh, director at SPY, Studies of Poverty and Inequality Institute in South Africa. And unfortunately, we had, also, we had invited uh, the Swedish former Minister of Development, uh, Gunilla Karlsson, uh, but she had to cancel her participation in the last minute, unfortunately. But we had invited her as a former member of the high-level panel on POS 2015. That because that high-level panel was one of the foundations, together with the, um, all the negotiations and the broad consultations of civil society, that led up to the new development agenda, Agenda 2030, and the Sustainable Development Goals. And we can see clearly in that agenda that the language for addressing inequality are quite strong and reference, several reference to social security. And the Nordic countries, we are uh, among the world's uh, most important countries with strong social security issues. And yet, Within the debate, the um, development debate and development policies within our countries, these issues have been quite absent. So that was a, was a question that we were starting to work at uh, for Church of Sweden. Having said that, I will leave the floor and the word to Gunilla Palm uh, to tell us a bit more why Church of Sweden works with social protection in uh, the advocacy work and as a policy issue, and what progress we have seen regarding social protection and an international development cooperation during the last years. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I hope that no one will confuse me with Gunilla Karlsson. Um, that would have made me the youngest minister for international development cooperation in Sweden's history. Um, yes, Church of Sweden has two entry points to work with social protection. The first is our mission through Diakonia, the service and care for our fellow human beings, especially the people living in poverty and in vulnerable, vulnerable situations. And the second is our rights-based approach in our work. Since we regard every person uh, as being born in the image of God with the right to a life in dignity. And that means, for example, that each person has the right to basic social and economic security. And together with our partner churches and civil society organizations around the world, we have worked uh, to, be able to enable people to have decent living conditions for a very long time. And what we have seen in our income generating activities in our projects is that they are very important and they do create jobs, but they do not reach the people that are the most vulnerable in many places, the people that cannot or should not work. Children, pregnant and lactating women, chronically ill, people living with disabilities, and the elderly. And for these faces and situations in life, another type of sustainable income is needed. And this is where social security or social protection comes in. And according to the ILO, 
as of today, 73% of the world's population lack access to any formal social security scheme. So during the last few years, when Church of Sweden has worked quite actively with this question, what we have seen in general is that social protection has risen high on the global development agenda. Thanks to international institutions such as the ILO, uh, the World Bank, albeit with a different approach, and the UNICEF, uh, as well as regional civil society organizations and research inst institutions. Some individual donor countries, among them actually the US, the UK, Japan and Canada, has invested quite substantially uh, in social protection in their development aid budgets. And of course, this progress has been even further strengthened with the social, uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and where social protection is explicitly mentioned as a tool to achieving three of these goals in their goal, in the sub goals, in the goal targets. And the first one is, of course, the first goal uh, to eradicate poverty. And then in goal number five of gender equality. And also in goal number 10, which have been spoken about a lot today, uh, to reduce inequalities within and among uh, countries. Um, and however, what has puzzled us when we, while we're working with this is that on the Swedish development agenda, we have not seen the same commitment for social protection as we have on the global uh, agenda. Although, uh, albeit our historic experience of a substantial and inclusive welfare state. Um, with, I mean, yeah. And not until very recently, this has actually now well, I would say the last, this year and the last, we see tendencies, we hear, we hear social protection being mentioned uh, by development, by our development agency, and we see it, we saw it in our development aid budget for 2016, although, well, we do not know now, at, as of today, if that can actually be funded. So we do see some tendencies, but it has been a much slower progress within Sweden, and I do also think within the other Nordic countries. Um, so what we see is that Sweden uh, and other Nordic countries, they still need to find a role in what, how the development work with social protection can, what that can look like. Um, what is our specific expertise and our specific experiences that we can contribute with. And one thing that we do see is that officials within the Ministry for Social Affairs and within the Authority for Social Insurances, they sit on a lot of competences, a lot of technical expertise that is an untapped potential in development work, uh, but they do not have the experience of actually transforming that into a development uh, agenda. And vice versa, uh, in our development agencies, we do not see the competence for social security structures and systems. So that is something that is needed. Um, and we also see that the Nordic countries can really play a role uh, in the global development discussion on social protection. There are a number of questions um, where experiences from Nordic countries can, uh, can be important. And just two of those uh, would be the question in the global agenda with social protection, where you talk about targeted or universal social protection, that is, should benefits be targeted at the poorest or should it go to all? Uh, and also on the discussion of conditional or unconditional grants, uh, should the benefits, social benefits demand good behavior in return, such as uh, school enrollment for children and the health clinic checkups and such, etc. And the last thing I would like to say is that what is important to remember is that despite the title uh, of this seminar, Church of Sweden do not think that Nordic welfare model is something that we can just export straight away and that we should see it that way. We should rather see it as something where you, we need uh, to have a high level of understanding of the contextual differences in different countries and a lot of humbleness uh, towards the fact that we're different. I'll stop there. And leave it for the discussion. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you so much. And I think that is something that we will elaborate on um, further on this, this session. Um, now we will have a crash course in uh, the Swedish, no, not the, the Nordic welfare system uh, before Oli. Uh, a short film from Norden. with all your experience as a professor and researcher, what are the most important features for the Nordic welfare system in their historical formation and in the present day and the design? And can lessons from the Nordic countries be relevant for low and middle income countries? Uh, please, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting seminar. When I was flying here uh, to this place this morning, uh, I happened to read the uh, Finnair newspaper and our Minister of uh, Finance, Alexander Stubb, had a column in the uh, paper and uh, he wrote about speaking and giving speeches. And uh, he had three things that he said that uh, a good speech must include. It's uh, logos, ethos, and pathos. And uh, in my presentation, I'm a little bit afraid that I don't have any of those three things. So that, uh, forgive me, but next time, I, I'm certain that uh, I will have all those three elements, just to give it. Yeah, very good speech. Um, anyway, there's some content in my presentation. Uh, I say in the very beginning some words about the Nordic model, then uh, something about poverty, and then uh, something about institutions and ideas, how they travel or if they travel at all. And then uh, perhaps this is uh, ethos, ethics. Uh, I say something about principles of just society and rely very much on general roles idea on uh, justice and then perhaps the main idea I have in my speech is social investment uh, that I think nowadays is a very central element of the Nordic welfare state and very much the European Commission is adapting those ideas and I think that those social investment ideas are very important also for development of politics. 
uh, the Nordic model. Uh, the, it said that the, the, there is a Nordic model, but there are five exceptions. Iceland is not that much, uh, or has not been that much presented here, but anyway, Iceland is the fifth element in the Nordic model. And the idea of the Nordic model, if it exists or not, depends very much if you are using a microscope as we do if we here in, if we here in the Nordic countries compare uh, ourselves with each other. There is, from the, let's say, from the global perspective, from the US perspective, uh, African perspective, the Nordic countries perhaps uh, seem to be very similar. And uh, there are still some elements that are very important for the Nordic model. Uh, in, in income inequality is very low here in the Nordic countries. It's increasing, but still by uh, European standard, not to speak about global standard, uh, income inequality is very, very low here. Uh, equality between genders, uh, the Nordic countries are leading the group when it comes to uh, gender equality. And also we have very high income mobility. I will come uh, later on that and also high labor market participation rates for all uh, sectors in society, both genders are much higher here than in uh, other parts in the world. And also in the film, there was something about the, the public sector and the size of the public sector. Uh, we have very heavy public sector and it demands very heavy tax load. But on the, on the other side, we have very uh, high labor force participation which compensates uh, very much. And the problems that perhaps we have in the case that we have high unemployment here, in that case uh, we run into problems because uh, in that case uh, we have some problems in finance. And then very much is spoken about the universal social policy and universalism usually means that everybody is covered. It uh, is more or less true still, but there are more or less uh, conditions nowadays, so that traditionality is uh, much more in the picture than it used to be. Uh, and also benefit levels, uh, they have not been the highest in the world, so that for, for example in very many Central European countries, benefit levels have been much higher, for example in Germany and some other uh, Central European countries. But the coverage or universalism has been uh, lower in, uh, in Central European countries and very many other countries. So that the uh, one element of the Nordic model is to combine universalism with uh, a reasonable level of compensations coming from income transfers. Uh, but uh, in this respect, very many other countries are catching up the Nordic countries. So that the, the Nordic countries used to be in the 70s, 80s, uh, and in the beginning of 90s in their own group with a rather high level of compensations and universal coverage. But the other countries are uh, including more and more population in the coverage and also uh, catching up the Nordic uh, benefit levels. So that uh, if you say that there's a, something called Nordic welfare state model, other countries are penetrating in, in that model. And then we can ask if it's still, or if it can be caught uh, as a Nordic, Nordic model. And uh, perhaps the most important thing is, uh, is uh, the aspect that in the Nordic countries, we don't only have very heavy social spending on the basis of social transfers, but the, uh, the Nordic countries are uh, so social service countries in contrast to Central European countries, for example, so that uh, we very much invest in social services instead of uh, uh, only investing in uh, social transfers, so that uh, there are Central European social transfer countries and the Nordic social uh, service countries that, uh, that we can speak about. And then uh, I saw a couple of pictures just to uh, somehow show you that uh, I'm speaking truth and perhaps this is the logos reasoning thing uh, in my speech. Uh, so that uh, if you look at child poverty, uh, that I think is one of the most important things to uh, alleviate and eradicate in our uh, country. So that uh, if you look at this picture, we see very much that the Nordic countries still are in their own group. 
and uh, pretty different from uh, the rest of the European uh, hemisphere, not to speak about uh, the whole, whole world. So that we have uh, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Iceland uh, have the lowest uh, child poverty rates uh, in comparison to the other, other European countries. And uh, then uh, if you look at poverty in families that are led by single mothers and that are led by two uh, uh, breadwinners, we see that again the Nordic countries are uh, very much in their group or own in that sense that poverty levels be the question of single uh, headed uh, households or uh, two parent households are much lower uh, than in, in uh, the other countries. And there's a marked uh, difference between the Nordic group and then the red, red one uh, that uh, somehow indicates the liberal uh, rich countries. And this indicates that it's not only the richness, the US is one of the richest countries in the world, but nevertheless, poverty rates among uh, families with children uh, are much higher than in the Nordic countries. So that institutions matter, not only money uh, as such. And then uh, poverty is relational in that sense that uh, if we have high level of child poverty, then uh, child poverty is linked to very many uh, different things. For example, and why I'm speaking about the uh, child poverty? Uh, the reason is that uh, in childhood we create ourselves. In childhood we create possibilities for our uh, future, uh, future life possibilities. And also in childhood we obtain different abilities, skills to manage our lives in, in later years. And here we have an x-axis childhood poverty and then uh, PISA scores uh, on the y-axis. And we see a pretty strong correlation between poverty and uh, learning on the other hand but also there's a very strong correlation between poverty and inability access to education, low birth weight, that is an indication, a very strong indication what is our health status in later years. And also infant mortality is very high, highly correlated with the childhood poverty, so that we can say that poverty kills, and it's very much true. And for example, Amartya Sen, uh, very much emphasizes that relative things or relative poverty can have absolute uh, outcomes. And uh, this infant mortality is perhaps the most absolute uh, outcome and it's linked to relative poverty rates. Not only in the in, uh, global context but also in the OECD hemisphere. And then uh, institutions or ideas the question is that if the Nordic model is uh, possible to transport to other or implement, implement to other countries. And uh, my argument is that the Nordic welfare states are historically and con contextually conditioned in that way that uh, the institutions are very difficult to implant in other countries or other parts of the world. For example, it's very difficult to implant the Swedish pension system in Malawi, for example. Uh, and uh, there are some elements that can possibly be adapted. Historical learning perhaps is one thing. So that uh, if you look at the history of the Nordic welfare states, and then we can see that the, the model was not there uh, in the very beginning, but there were baby steps that were taken, uh, taken and then gradually we ended up with this kind of, of model that uh, we have in the Nordic countries just now. And uh, therefore ideas are better to travel. And then uh, what are those ideas that could be uh, implemented in other countries and in other uh, parts of the world. And uh, I think that one of the most important things in uh, our countries here in the Nordic hemisphere and elsewhere is that society should, uh, should be just. And one of the most beautiful uh, descriptions of, of uh, social justice is given by John Rawls in his uh, theory of uh, social justice, where he says that uh, all institutions that are producing 
social inequalities should be in, uh, equally open to everybody. And it means that, for example, the educational system in all countries uh, selects people in positions, selects people in higher positions, gives them money, and gives the, the health, and gives the everything. So that, uh, that kind of shorting mechanisms according to roles should be open to everybody. But in all countries, uh, it's so that this uh, very hard uh, and, uh, to my mind, very good demand is not met. And here in this picture, generational income mobility, we have income inequality in the x-axis and then intergenerational income mobility on the y-axis. And the higher the <coughs> income inequality is, we see, it, for example, in the US and UK, Italy, France, uh, the uh, intergenerational income mobility is lower than in the Nordic countries, led by Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Sweden, the income mobility between generations is a little bit lower. And the rationality here is that uh, if the correlation is very high, it means that the parents and children's incomes are very highly correlated. So uh, it means that we are living in a closed society where, where your position is very dependent on your parents' positions. Whereas in the case that the correlation is low, uh, like in the Nordic countries, uh, there's a high mobility between generations. So that my position or my parents' position uh, don't uh, dictate my future position or my position. And this, I think, is a very good uh, idea to adapt for, for all countries, not only for the Nordic countries. And then finally, uh, I said that the social investment is a very important thing in the Nordic countries. And if you look at the present state here in the Nordic, we are investing very much in unborn children, uh, for example, screening uh, pregnant uh, mothers and giving the uh, education, giving the, uh, the uh, advice and giving the medical, uh, medical services. And then in childhood, we have childhood education, we have different kind of screening of small children, and then we are trying to develop cognitive qualifications by high level of primary and secondary education that's uh, open for everybody. There are some differences between the Nordic countries uh, if they, uh, there are private schools or not. And for example, in the Swedish case, uh, they have private schools that perhaps explain why the generational mobility in Sweden is a little bit lower than, than for example, in Finland that, uh, that uh, has only public schools. And then also uh, different kind of services that we are giving for, for families with children facilitate the uh, female labor force participation that's high uh, in the Nordics, as I said. And also a kind of investment uh, strategy is also applied for, for uh, all elderly people by giving the possibilities to, to live their own lives and also serving uh, their, to their homes by the public sector uh, care facilities with also freeze uh, most of all women others uh, to, to participate in paid labor and in that sense also contribute to the national economy. And uh, to conclude, the Nordic model is there, but uh, perhaps it's not uh, that uh, distinctive as it used to be. Uh, in its heyday, uh, sometimes uh, 10, 20 years ago, and other countries are adapting our models. And as they say, for example, in Germany, that uh, Germany, when it comes to family policies and other services, are going Swedish. And uh, ideas travel better than institutions, and the key ideas that uh, I try to propose here, uh, the uh, social justice, and uh, uh, investment, and to create in that way open and transparent uh, society. And the crucial role is uh, universal education that pays back. And also, uh, when it comes to development the context, uh, uh, we have very much evidence, empirical evidence, that uh, literature rates among women are very highly correlated, negatively correlated uh, with uh, infant mortality rates. And then, 
just and inclusive institutions cre create just societies and trust and trust is one of the key elements in the Nordic. Nordic countries also trust in institutions, trust in fellow people, and uh, those ingredients are very important to, for nations to flourish. Thank you so much, Professor Kangas, for that and for bringing in um, for the, the issues of trust and justice.